Hello everybody and welcome to another video. This time it's going to be a, a twofer because I know we've got a lot to do this week and I'm going to put it all into one massive video. Uh, first thing we're going to do is go over some grammar, uh, some parts of grammar that we haven't covered yet. And then we're going to look at how to integrate sources into your papers, which was an issue that many of you had. So I want to make sure that we address that as best we can. Okay, I'm going to be giving you two PowerPoint presentations, lucky you. Both of these are in the multimedia folder of course documents, by the way. So if I go too fast or you want to review it later, you absolutely can. You just need to download and open those presentations. All right, what are pronouns? Well, pronouns are, well, he's wondering too. Pronouns are place nouns. They keep you from having to repeat the same nouns over and over again. Instead of having to say something like, say Jean gave a bone to say Jean's dog, which would be really, really, really repetitive after a while, you could just say, say Jean gave a bone to his dog. We're using the third person possessive pronoun there, his, because say Jean is male. In this case, we've used a possessive pronoun and we've replaced the proper name so we don't have to repeat it. That's one of the things that a pronoun does. And there are various different types of pronouns too. There are subject pronouns, there are object pronouns, there are possessive pronouns, and there are reflexive possessive pronouns. And I'll show you how each one of those works. All right, what's the correct way to use each of these pronouns you ask? Well, I'll tell you. Pronouns have to agree with their antecedents, the word that comes before the pronoun that that pronoun refers to. That's the ante part. If ever you play poker, you're gonna ask, you're gonna be asked to do an ante, which is a pre-bet where you put some money into the pot before you start betting. It's called an ante because you're doing it before anything else goes on. Same way, something in a sentence or a paragraph may be the antecedent of the pronoun, and it has to be clear. If you have two or more antecedents joined by and, you use a plural pronoun, as in this sentence. Jeff, Edwin, and Jay are celebrating their birthdays today. So they each have a birthday, they're all on the same day, but it's everybody's birthday, there are three of them. You wouldn't say Jeff, Edwin, and Jay are celebrating his birthday today because that would make no sense. So you have to make sure that you're using a plural pronoun there. If, however, You've got two or more singular antecedents that are joined by or or nor, you use a singular pronoun. Either Daniel or Jeff has left his backpack in the room. Daniel and Jeff are not part of a communist socialist society and they don't share a backpack. So you would not say their backpack because of the either and the or, or neither nor for that matter. Neither Daniel nor Jeff left his backpack in the room. You're referring to just one of them, not to both. If the sentence has a compound subject, but it refers to only one person, and this is a pretty rare thing, by the way, you should use a singular pronoun, as in the sentence, my friend and neighbor, Jay, keeps his lawnmower in my garage. Jay is my friend, he's also my neighbor, therefore that's gonna be a compound subject, but it's still gonna be one person, and therefore one singular noun and therefore it's gonna be one singular pronoun. Another thing to remember about pronouns is that if the antecedent is anybody, each, everybody, neither, no one, somebody, anyone, either, everyone, nobody, one, or someone, you should use a singular pronoun. And that should make sense, except for some people think that anybody or everybody is plural, and it's not. Because you wouldn't say everybody are coming over, would you? No, you'd say, Everybody is coming over. Each of the boys interviewed his grandmother because each boy has a separate grandmother. If you were to say each of the boys interviewed their grandmother, that would mean that they all have the same grandmother. That's how that sentence would change just because of the change in pronoun. All right, another thing to keep in mind that if the pronoun is meant to refer to both males and females, or if it's unclear which gender is being referred to, use his or her, and yes, I know what you're about to say. Everyone should bring his or her homework in tomorrow. Now, almost nobody says that. And <clears throat> now that we live in a society 
where we have people who identify as gender non-binary, it actually makes more sense to say there. In an everyday speech, you'll notice that people will say everyone should bring their homework in tomorrow. That's fine in informal speech. It shouldn't be used in formal or academic writing unless the teacher says otherwise. And by the way, I'm fine with you doing that if you want to remain completely non-sexist. Forgive the noise in the background, by the way. It's my cat who has decided that now is the perfect time to eat his food and try to bury it. How dare you? You stupid little... Anyway, there are different kinds of pronouns, obviously, like I said at the beginning. One of them is subject pronouns. Subject pronouns are used when the pronoun functions as the subject of a sentence or of a clause. For example, Jeff and he are finding info on the internet. Now, probably in regular usage, you'd say Jeff and him. You wouldn't say him is finding info on the internet, would you? No, of course not. So since he is in here, even though it's coupled with Jeff, it would still be a subject pronoun. We often visit wikipedia.org. Boy, howdy, do we ever. And the information that they find is very interesting. Those are all subject pronouns. Subject pronouns include I, you, he, she, it, we, you, and they. You notice that you is repeated there, and that's not an accident. It has to do with the English language. In fact, I may have talked about this in class, and hopefully I'm not repeating myself if I have. Most languages distinguish between a second person singular pronoun and a second person plural pronoun. For instance, in Spanish, you have tu and you have ustedes. In French, you have toi and you have vous. English doesn't have that anymore. We use you when I'm talking to you, specifically you person that's looking into the camera right now, or you, my larger audience, regardless of how big that audience is. English did used to have that form, though. And in fact, if you've ever said the Lord's Prayer, or ever heard it, if you decide not to say it, then you have heard that second person singular form being used, as in thou, thy, thine. Those are the forms of that second person pronoun. That is the form that you would use with, say, one person. So when addressing, for instance, the higher power, you wouldn't say you because if you still used thou, you'd be talking to you as a plural. You can see why we got rid of it because English tends to streamline things quite a bit and we tend to innovate on our language quite a bit. So we don't have thou, thine, and thy as anymore, except in two places. One in deep Appalachia where they still speak a form of English that is close to uh, early 18th century, or 17th century, more like. Uh, and also, the Amish tend to use the thy and thou in the correct way. Another use for subject pronouns is when the pronoun is the predicate nominative of a sentence or clause. Now, what the hell is that, you ask? I'll tell you. Predicate nominative is a noun or pronoun that follows a form of the verb to be and it renames or identifies a subject or describes it. For example, who are the most frequent internet users in the class? Well, the most frequent internet users in the class are Jay and I. That's a weird one, isn't it? The way to figure that out is to flip it. To say, if you were to say Jay and I are the most frequent internet users in the class, then it's still subject pronoun, isn't it? it's still the subject of the sentence. If you're flipping it the other way, the most frequent internet users in the class are J and I, then the subject is users. And of course, most frequent internet are just adjectives that identify what type of user or describe. So J and I are now names in the predicates or predicate nominative. And you would use subject pronouns for that, even though, again, in everyday speech, you're more likely to say the most frequent internet users in the class are J and me. Other frequent users are he and she. And again, 
here's another weirdness of English and the difference between formality and informality. If you're using formal English and you answer the phone, you would actually say, it is I, Angela. I don't know why I put Angela on there. <laughs> it's the first name that came to mind, but it is I. But we don't do that. We say, it's me. Hello, it's me. Hello, it's me. Now, where we do use the predicate nominative correctly is if a telemarketer calls or somebody who's asking for us by name and they say, hello, is this so-and-so, is this Angela? She would say, this is she. And you see how that works. This is going to be the subject. You've got a form of to be and is, and she is going to be the predicate. Object pronouns are used when the pronoun functions as the direct object or indirect object of a sentence or clause. And that's exactly what it says. A direct object is what directly receives the action of the verb. I hit my cat. No, I don't. I don't hit my cat at all. But when he eats while I'm trying to record a lecture, I get a little stroppy with him. Anyway, my cat eats food. There we go. That's much better. And he eats it at all the wrong times. Food is the direct object. What does he eat? My cat eats it. While the indirect object follows the verb and answers the question to whom, for whom, to what, or for what, following the action verb. Who is taking this action? I gave my cat some food. I didn't give my cat. The cat would be the direct object if I were doing that. I gave my cat. But if I say I gave my cat, the indirect object, some food, then the indirect object is going to be cat and the direct object is going to be the food. Object pronouns include me, you, him, her, it, us, and them. Possessive pronouns are used to denote to whom or to what an object usually a noun belongs. These are usually in two forms, one of which occurs only in front of objects and one that can be used without it. And that's what I mean by reflexive pronouns. For instance, possessive pronouns are going to include my, which you'd use in front of a noun, and mine, as in that is mine, that's going to be reflexive. You and yours, his and his, her and hers, that actually changes its form. It's, and it's doesn't have a reflexive pronoun for some reason. It doesn't have a reflexive possessive pronoun. You would say the cat is in its bed, but you wouldn't say the cat bed is its. Do you see how that works? We just don't do that in English for some reason. Instead, we go to the bed belongs to the cat or the cat, the bed cat, uh, da, da, da. the bed is the cat's or the bed. Yeah, you get the idea. Our and ours and their and theirs. And the possessive pronoun is also used before gerunds, which are verb form endings in ing that are actually nouns. People get freaked out by this rule because formally, this is actually how you do it. You wouldn't say, do you mind me asking her to the dance? You would say, do you mind my asking her to the dance? Yeah, I know, right? Nobody ever does this. You would usually say me, but it doesn't work for a couple reasons. Do you mind me means do you mind my existence? <laughs> do you mind that I am here? And it would make sense to say that, do you mind me asking her to the dance? It doesn't connect up with the rest of the sentence. But if you say, do you mind my asking her to the dance? You're saying, do you mind my act of asking her to the dance? My act of asking is a noun. See how that works? And because it's a noun, because you put the possessive pronoun in front of that, you wouldn't say me because that's an object pronoun. You'd say my. Of course, nobody does this correctly. Probably it's going to die out of the language within the next few generations because nobody does it, but that's actually the way it's done correctly. So remember that for your Kahoot questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, here's some examples. Dad took Liam and me to Kitty Hawk. He took us to Kitty Hawk, which is going to be the indirect object of this because he didn't take Kitty Hawk. 
So Liam and me are the direct objects of the verb to take. He showed us the site of the first flight. Again, us in the sentence is the direct object of to show and site is the direct object. He showed to us the site of the first flight. Okay, now this is one of the big questions in grammar. I or me in a sentence. Would you say so-and-so and I are going, or would you say so-and-so and me are going? Well, you should be able to answer that already with what I've just told you. Choosing whether you use I or me in the sentence depends on whether the pronoun being used is being used as a subject or an object. If you have a compound construction, easy to figure it out, just take out the other pronoun and figure out which sounds better. For example, with this sentence, Edwin and are going to the store. Which one would you use? Hmm? Hmm. Obviously, I can't hear you, but if you said Edwin and I are going, then you'd be correct. How about this one? The teacher gave the book to say Jean and <laughs> Hmm, that one's tricky. You would not say the teacher gave the book to say Jean and I, you'd say say Jean and me. And here's how you check it. Take out the other person or the pronoun in the sentence. I am going to the store. That means you have to change the form of the verb to be, obviously. The teacher gave the book to me. The teacher didn't give the book to I. So that's how you figure that out. Ah, and here's the big one. Who or whom? You've probably been taught that you use who when you're being informal, whom when you're being informal. It's not that. In fact, it's really simple. Who is a pronoun, so is whom. And deciding which one to use is determined exclusively by whether the pronoun is being used as a subject pronoun or as an object pronoun. To check which one works best, replace who or whom in the sentence with he or him or she or her. If he, she sounds right, choose who. If him, her sounds right, choose whom. And by the way, if you're being gender neutral, I'll replace it with they or them. If they sounds right, choose who. And if them sounds right, choose whom. Or change the question into a statement, or change it into a statement. Who, whom should we contact? We should contact him, we should contact them, we should contact her. So we would use whom should we contact. Hopefully you heard that over that jerk face with his uh, loud ass car. We should contact him. So we would use whom should we contact. Here's some common mistakes with pronouns. Using a pronoun requires all of the words necessary to complete the meaning of the sentence. For instance, this is the correct form of a sentence. Billy looks up to Mr. Carver more than I, not more than me. Do you see why? Here's why. It's what that sentence is saying. Billy looks up to Mr. Carver more than I look up to Mr. Carver. If you were to say, Billy looks up to Mr. Carver more than me, then that would mean Billy looks up to Mr. Carver more than he looks up to me. Does that make sense? That's what's going on there. Billy looks up to Mr. Carver more than he looks up to me. Obviously, that would be me rather than I at that point. Another common mistake is to avoid ambiguous constructions in which pronouns can refer to more than one antecedent. Janet discussed the project with Elaine because she knew all the details. So I ask you, who knew all the details? Was it Janet? Was it Elaine? Who knows? Who was phoned? I don't know. But in this case, you've probably been taught in the past that whatever subject is closer to that pronoun is correct, but it's still ambiguous. Even if you go by that rule, it could still be Janet, even if you think it's Elaine. You may have to repeat the word, or you may have to do something very different by putting that clause at the end, the because clause, this is part of the sentence here, and putting it at the beginning of the sentence, making it an independent, I'm sorry, dependent clause, so that whatever follows that clause has to be whatever it's referring to. 
And we're going to get to modifiers, by the way, in the next little bit. Because she knew all the details, Janet discussed the project with Elaine. That would work a lot better and it would get around any ambiguity. Also, and this is something that I uh, had to ding several of you on in your papers, it's common error, so don't feel bad if you were dinged. Avoid using they, it, and you, as well as their, it's, your, and yours, to refer to an unnamed person or a group. Only use you when you're referring to the reader. They say it will be cold tomorrow. W2F or they. You would say the news says it will be cold tomorrow. Some teachers do not let you wear a hat in class. You specifically, you're not allowed to wear a hat in class. No, that's not what that sentence should be saying because it's not that some teachers only allow one person or disallow them from wearing a hat in class. Some teachers do not let students wear hats in class. But you do use you when giving directions or instructions. And at the end of conditional phrases such as, if you were in this situation, if you were this, if you were that, then you might do this. If then statements, you can use you because you're positing a condition that may or may not be true. Therefore, it works. All right. I am going to let you go through these on your own. They are at the end of the PowerPoint, and I want you to check to see what you think those answers are. I may indeed ask you to choose one of the sentences and put it in your discussion. Not quite sure yet, but they're all there, so you can uh, give it a shot, and we'll see how you do on those. We have another PowerPoint, yay. This one on modifiers, namely adjectives and adverbs. What are they? Why are you asking me? Oh wait, I know. Adjectives give color, size, shape, dimension, and all sorts of other qualities to nouns and pronouns by modifying them, which is why they're called modifiers. A yellow ribbon, dirty socks, vile coworkers, which we don't have to deal with anymore because we're all in quarantine and yeah, whatever. Proper adjectives begin with a capital letter. So if we're talking about the Korean language or Brazilian soccer, which would just be football, or European tourists, we would use a capital letter for those because it's an indic indicator of who or what that thing actually is, a specific type, but it comes from a proper name, such as Korea, Brazil, or Europe. While many adjectives come right before the nouns they modify, there are predicate adjectives that follow a linking verb to modify the subject of the sentence. Now remember what we said about predicate nominative, nominative, predicate nominatives. Jeez. Ugh, I'm going to leave that in because it's a hard word to say. You should know that it's bad. Predicate adjectives function the same way. That linking verb is usually a form of to be. Montinez is ill today. I hope it's not too ill. What are you doing there? You are modifying Montinez. Montinez is, that's not a sentence. You have to say what he is. He is ill, that describes Montinez. The teacher's mood is particularly vicious after several days in isolation with just the cats. Yes. Whatever position these occur in, two or more adjectives can modify the same noun. The weather appears cloudy and brackish. And by the way, that's one of those, uh, those adjectives that can actually jump in position. You could also say the water appears brackish and cloudy. That's perfectly fine. The cat is fun, furry, and smart. He is not fun. He's far too furry, and he's not very smart. Are you kidding? And of course, now he's asleep. Forget it. Adverbs also modify things, but they modify verbs and adjectives and other adverbs. She peered hopefully into the distance. Yes, hoping that her stimulus check was coming in the mail in a couple of weeks, don't we all hope. How did she peer? She peered hopefully. That's going to modify a verb. Yesenia is extraordinarily bright. Bright is gonna be an adjective. It's gonna be a predicate adjective. How bright is she? She's extraordinarily bright. 
And Martin left the room rather abruptly. Now, this one's interesting because there are two things going on here. Um, luckily, I'm not having you di diagram sentences because it's a very boring process. But if you were to look at the sentence, who is the subject of the sentence? Martin. What's the simple verb? Left. Martin left. That's not enough information on its own. What did he leave? He left the room. There we go. Martin left the room. Now, how did he leave? He left the room abruptly. So abruptly is actually modifying left. So it's modifying the verb. Rather is modifying abruptly. How abruptly did he leave? He left rather abruptly. He left stupidly abruptly. He left incredibly abruptly. He left kind of abruptly. Yeah, those are all adverbs. In addition, many adverbs come before or after the verbs they modify, as we just saw. Rapidly, we descended the stairs, or we descended the stairs rapidly. But if you put an adverb at the beginning of a sentence, it's probably going to look like this. It's going to be an, uh, a dependent clause, and it's going to have a comma after it. Or we descended the stairs rapidly, same thing. Although most adverbs end in ly, some of them don't. And you have to be careful of that. You saw that rather, for instance, does not end in ly. Seldom doesn't end in ly. You can actually say seldomly, but that means something different. Never is an adverb. I never do that. How often do I do that? I never do that. I always do that. How often do you do that? I always do that. When will you do it? I'll do it soon. I'll do it today. I'll do it now. I'll do it here. Yeah, you see how that works, that those are all going to act as adverbs, and they're all going to modify mostly verbs, but also other adverbs. Intensifiers are verbs that answer the question to what extent, and these tell you the extent to which something happens. When we said rather abruptly, we were telling the extent to which he left the room abruptly. Jeff is somewhat lazy about his homework. Jeff is always lazy about his homework. Jeff is never lazy about his homework. Jeff is lazy today about his homework. Tomorrow he may not be. And you see how that works. See, Jean was less surprised than I was. Or if we were going to do that whole thing we do with pronouns just a little minute ago, see, Jean was less suppressed. <laughs> less suppressed. Not if he's in North Korea. Uh, see, Jean was less surprised than I. That's how you would do that. And Jay can sometimes be too quiet. J can sometimes, and you notice sometimes, again, is an, ad, an adverb because it's modifying B, but then too quiet is actually modifying the act of being quiet, if that makes sense. This modifies this, and this is modifying the whole thing. I know, it's tricky. When do you use one or the other? It depends on what you're modifying. Is it a noun, a verb, a pronoun, an adjective, an adverb? If it's a noun or a pronoun, it's the adjective. The water tasted bad. You would not say the water tasted badly because the water has no sense of taste and it hasn't lost that sense of taste. So it wouldn't taste badly. If the word is a verb, an adjective, or another adverb, you use the adverb. The students need his advice badly. So you wouldn't say, I need this advice real bad. You wouldn't say that. Actually, you probably do, some of you, but that would not be correct. You would actually use badly. Again, there's some examples back behind here. And we also have these things that we need to talk about, which are compound misplaced or dangling modifiers. Valerie wrote, yeah, Valerie wrote a letter to her best friend about her trip. You see how each of those sentences says something different. Valerie wrote a letter about her trip to her best friend. But listen to the wording there. Valerie wrote a letter about her trip to her best friend? You wouldn't say that, would you? You'd say, Valerie wrote a letter about her trip to visit her best friend. That makes sense. The way this is worded doesn't, whereas the second one, that makes more logical sense. Valerie wrote a letter to her best friend about her trip. 
if you were doing a Kahoot on this, you would go for the one that makes more logical sense. Just saying, there may be a Kahoot question like this. Some of them are pretty easy to tell, but the way to correct a misplaced modifier is to move it as close as possible to the word you want it to modify, which generally involves rewording the sentence. I almost ate all of the toast. How much of the toast did I eat? None. Think about the sentence and what it's saying. I almost ate all of the toast. And then I realized I was on a diet and I shouldn't be eating anything. I almost ate. See, that's how that works. But if you wanted to say, there was so much toast and I just scarfed it down like the piglet that I am, and I only left the bare sliver for my sister, brother, sibling, or loved one, you would say, I ate almost all the toast and left them just a itty bitty crumb because I love them so. Yeah, that's the difference between those two sentences. Is that woman over there with the small child the one who gave you the dirty look? Whew. That one's tricky to parse, isn't it? It's kind of difficult to figure out what's being said there. But if you say it this way, is the woman who gave you the dirty look the one over there with the small child? So we know for sure it's the woman who gave you the dirty look. In the first sentence, we don't know if it's the woman or we don't know if it's the child that gave you the dirty look. The second sentence makes it clear. Dangling modifiers, oh my God. Dangling modifiers are unintentionally hilarious every time. It's a word or a phrase or a clause that doesn't logically modify anything in the sentence. Unlike a misplaced modifier, the information needed to make the sentence make sense is missing and you have to rewrite it completely. For example, Looking out my kitchen window, two foxes ran across the yard. Wait, is that some kind of weird inception-y type thing where the foxes are looking out your kitchen window and seeing themselves running across the yard? Who's looking out my kitchen window? When I looked out my kitchen window, I saw two foxes running across the yard. In fact, you don't even have to reword it that much. You could just say, looking out my kitchen window, I saw two foxes running across the yard. If ever I talk about a dangling modifier, uh, then I'm going to bring that up to you. I'm going to say, who is this? Who's the subject? The subject has to follow immediately or else that dangles. The only way to fix it without necessarily doing anything to it is by saying two foxes ran across the yard. No, you still have to do it, don't you? Two foxes ran across the yard while I was looking out my kitchen window. You still have to do it. All right. After searching for hours, that should say hours, the missing letter turned up on my dresser. Well, a letter doesn't search for itself. That's just weird. It's raining. Aw, it's raining. Sorry, I got a little distracted. It's raining. I wish I could go out and frolic in the rain. No, I don't, because I'd be upset. After searching for hours, I found the missing letter on my dresser, right? Now, I will go over these with you, because these are fun. These are all incorrect modifier placements, and you're probably going to say, but Mr. Witt, you say in that voice that I do when I do a student voice, Mr. Witt, how do we know that they're incorrect? You have to read them and you have to figure out what it's saying. You told me that you finished your essay already. Okay, let's think about this. Your friend is telling you that the essay that they were assigned was completed ahead of time. So they're not saying, you told me that you finished your essay already. They are instead saying, you told me that you already finished your essay. You see the difference? Already placed where it is, is gonna modify the whole thing. In fact, if we were to put it in another place, you'd see why that changes it. You already told me that you finished your essay, doofus. What, are you going senile? You already told me, duh. Yeah, that's how that would be different. We listened to the songs of Wales at Nyla's house. 
damn, she must have a pretty big house. You can hear that something's wrong with that sentence, right? Yeah. There are no whales at Nyla's house. We listened to the songs of whales at Nyla's house doesn't quite get it. This one you'd have to flip. You'd have to say, at Nyla's house, we listen to the songs of whales. Now, if you want to do another version of it, which no, no one would ever say, you could say, we listened at Nyla's house to the songs of whales. But most people are going to put it at the beginning as a dependent clause. We poured lemonade for everyone in tall glasses. Everyone in short glasses had to go without. We poured lemonade in tall glasses for everyone. In fact, you'd probably say we poured lemonade for every, uh, lemonade into tall glasses for everyone because you'd change that. Megan only paid me half of what she owed me. This one is tricky, and it's hard to explain why it's wrong until I tell you how it's said correctly. Megan paid me only half of what she owed me. Megan owed me $100. She paid me only $50. Now, if I were to say Megan only paid me half of what she owed me, the rest she made up by doing some chores for me. You see how that modifies it. Only paid means only payment, but paid only means that certain amount. Paid me only half. The only, in fact, is modifying the amount and not the verb. And the last one, the team only practices on Saturdays and Mondays. Wow, they must be exhausted. No wonder they're not winning anything this season. You see the difference? If you say they only practice on Saturdays and Mondays, what you're saying is all they do is practice. They don't eat, they don't sleep, they don't poop. They don't do anything but practice the whole day on Saturday and on Monday. Whereas what you meant to say is the team practices only on Saturdays and Mondays. They have a two-hour practice because they're not, you know, the coach is not a monster. But he has them practice only on Saturdays and Mondays for those two hours, which again explains why they're not winning. There's another example, but, you know, I'll let you do that on your own. Now, I told many of you that you were having difficulties integrating sources into your papers. Um, what many of you tended to do was just to drop a quote into the paper and then put a citation after it. And in each case, I told you to introduce your quote. I'm not sure if we actually went over the quote sandwich in class, but we need to if we haven't, because it looks like many of you are not eating that quote sandwich. It doesn't have to be a burger, by the way. It can be the, and it doesn't matter to me. But the main thing is you need to introduce any quote that you have with a single phrase and an active verb, such as Seidel argues that, researchers observed, according to CNN, the article blah, blah, blah states that, and then you add your quote. Seidel argues that paper note cards are an inefficient way to create a research log. Boy, that's old fashioned, of course they are. No one uses paper note cards anymore except for me. And once you're done with it, you have to explain why the quote is important. What does it mean? How does it connect with your thesis? And the explanation should be at least as long, if not longer than the quote itself. What many of you are doing is you were doing just this. And some of you weren't even doing this. You were, you were just putting a quote in there and saying, paper note cards are an inefficient way to create a research log. And then Seidel 188. That's what you can do after you've introduced who Seidel is. And I mean by Seidel, you mean to say, um, the, the author of the article, blah, 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 John Seidel argues that the first time you do it, you give a full introduction of your source. The second time you can get away with putting just the quote in there, but you still need that bottom bun. Because nobody eats a sandwich without the bottom bun. It is possible to have Texas style sand, uh, Texas toast style sandwiches where you don't have the top bun, but you should still have it. You should still have these things. There are, of course, exceptions to every rule. If, for instance, you're opening the paper with an anecdote and you want that to be your hook for your paper, you're not going to say, according to Munoz, uh, 
I can't pronounce that name. Weinisht, there it is. Weinisht Mesfin, or as her friends called her Whiny, was a Disney Parks maintenance worker. You wouldn't say according to Munoz. And you notice here that they put Munoz in. Now, if I go back to the Works Cited page, by the way, this is from a, one of the two A- papers that uh, were done for paper number two last time we did them. Not last time, but some time ago. Uh, if we go back, we find Munoz. So we can find it. We know what it is, and it looks like, okay, so the whole story has been told to us. We don't necessarily need anything more than that. So that would be an example of an exception. Here we've got an example of an exception where the person has integrated part of their quote with their words. If you do that, that's fine because to some degree you are introducing the quote. You're just not saying who it comes from. A much better way to introduce the quote following quotation sandwich is this. In his article, A Higher Minimum Wage Will Not Hurt Minorities or Eliminate Jobs, Richard Escow points out that most minimum wage workers are adults, the majority of them are women, and many are parents who are trying to raise their children on poverty wages, and that less than 16% of these workers are teenagers. Most minimum wage workers are adults that are only able to rely on these types of jobs. Now you see what they did. They gave us a credit tag. They gave us the quote. They even managed to integrate a paraphrase of the rest of what Ascal does along with the quote in the same sentence, which is absolutely impressive. If you can do that, I'm gonna be, uh, by the end of this class, I'm gonna be so happy. And then they explained the quote. Now let's see if we can find another one in the same thing. Sometimes again, you're not gonna need to. Basically, it comes down to this, just roll with it. Just try to figure out when you need to do that and when you don't. If you have not introduced a source, you need to. But if there's a piece of information that stands on its own and you think, okay, the citation's gonna be enough to carry this, then you can get away with something like this or you can get away with something like this. By the way, this is another thing. This is an, an instance of having two sources by the same person. This is how you would do it. Of course, it would be better to say in her article, how bad is inflation, Amadeo says this, but you can still go back to the work side page. That gives me enough info to see that there are actually three articles by Amadeo and this one is the one that it has to be because it's got a shortened version of the title in the citation. Just like that. And again, you notice that, uh, that every once in a while, this person is not doing that sort of thing. By the way, the uh, commas is probably why they got the, uh, the minus, the A minus, because they forgot no commas in there. You'd actually take those commas out. But the rest of it is fine. The rest of the citations are fine. In fact, they may have gotten an A minus because they did that so often. You need to judge and figure out exactly when that's going to work for you and when you can avoid doing it. So have some sense with it. Absolutely, have some sense with it. All right, so that's it for me. I know it's been long, right? Sorry. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Or if if you didn't enjoy it, you at least learned something from it. Comment below to let me know that you saw it. Uh, comment below to tell me any questions you have. You can email me, you can text me, you can even call me, or you can get on Zoom and you can contact me that way. Just, you know, make sure you email me to let me know when you want me to meet you here on Zoom. And also, everything that's going to be covered in this is going to be on this week's Kahoot. So, if you didn't watch this, uh, yeah. Anyway, hope you're doing well. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.